Good morning and welcome to a very special episode of The Angry Astronaut. I am joined by Thor Fandel, who heads up the Icelandic Space uh, Agency. Is that correct? Is that what you call yourself? Well, or? we're called Space Iceland. Iceland doesn't actually have a space agency right. at the moment. So, uh, we're very, very pleased that Thor has given us this opportunity to uh, speak to them today, and uh, we're going to look at some opportunities, collaborative types of ideas, this sort of thing, and also learn about some of the uh, surprising details of the history of space exploration um, through uh, that's happened here in this uh, beautiful country. So, uh, first of all, you could tell us a little bit more about your organization, what your responsibility is to the government, that sort of thing, and, and what you're looking to accomplish. Well, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, so Space Iceland is, um, it was set up by the sector in Iceland. There is a, it's a relatively small but thriving sector here. Uh, it's important to note that we are not a government agency, we're, we're a sector initiative. Um, and our focus, Space Iceland's focus is politics and policy, helping with uh, permits and, and kind of attracting opportunities for the local sector. But, but also kind of, I would say an important thing is uh, to normalize the idea that Iceland is particip participating in space. So we're not really at the moment where we need to decide if we want to tag along. We've been doing it for years, but we, we would benefit from deciding what we want and utilizing the opportunity. So if I'm a private space company, for example, like Rocket Lab, say, and I want to launch from here, I might coordinate that that sort of initiative through you, and you would help us uh, as like intermediaries with the government? Is that sort of how it would be? Yeah. I mean, uh, if you have any space-related op operation in Iceland, and, and we have quite a broad definition of what sort of the space sector is here, um, it, it would be very likely that you would uh, go through us or... or or kind of work with our partners. I mean, it would it would probably be almost impossible for you not to work with some of our partners, but um, it's obviously, it would be your choice if you would want to become a member or a partner of Space Iceland. Excellent. Well, we're going to be showing you guys some footage of the uh, history of the acti various activities uh, that have happened here in Iceland as we continue our conversation. My name is Jordan Wright. I was born in the same year that the human race took its first steps on the surface of another world, and then we promptly betrayed those people's legacy by never going back. But now, over half a century later, there's a new breed of pioneers that are seeking to finish what these people set out to do so long ago. But there is trouble as well, so it's time for commentators like me to stop being polite and start getting angry! So Thor, as you just clarified for me, you're not a governmental agency, nor is there any kind of Icelandic space agency. Um, and this isn't really something you're trying to pursue, right? Um, instead, what is it that you're looking for? Well, I mean, uh, we just don't think it's politically plausible that we would be able to get uh, a space agency. But I think uh, the main focus right now is uh, obviously we do need a minister that is responsible for space affairs and there is there is some um, development in that uh, we're, we're kind of we feel um, we feel quite po positively that we'll get one soon it has been a bit of a, a roller coaster it's kind of gone between uh, ministries and there have been some uh, ideas thrown around um, but it seems right now that the most sort of natural minister is the Ministry of Transport uh, the Ministry of Transport handles um, airspace and they do have some responsibilities surrounding um, Iceland's access to satellites. So it does seem 
like you will end there. So when Skyrora launched the uh, Skylark Micro um, from the northern coast, I believe, of, of Iceland, how did they go about getting permission for that? What all did they have to go through in order to accomplish that? And why did they decide to launch from Iceland as opposed to, say, the Orkneys or something like that? Um, well, why they decided it is something that Skyrora would have to answer. We generally kind of don't comment on um, on on why uh, how our partners reach their internal decisions. But how did they go about? Um, I mean, space uh, governance in Iceland is extremely fragmented. That's one of the first thing that you need to understand. Um, so you you go about by asking literally everyone if they have something to do with it that, that's sort of the first step <laughs> of it um, and then you have to be quite creative you have to kind of acknowledge that um, there there isn't much in our law about rocket launches but uh, you can um, you can always um, in a way attempt to equalize you can you can point out a regulation or a legal framework that serves a similar purpose and, and could be useful and then obviously it's up to the government if they think that is a is a reasonable uh, idea uh, the, but I think the, the main thing um, with their uh, with the Skyrora launch is that it was a, it had a scientific purpose as well it is a development launch and Iceland generally is quite open towards uh, science and research, so that kind of helps you out. Uh, it also had to do with patience and uh, the fact that they reached out to the government. I mean, that that was the start of it. But it is it, it's kind of it is very complicated to launch from Iceland, uh, f and one of the reasons is that it's not necessarily something that was ever put in the sort of strategic planning for. Iceland. It's not really something that the government has been um, attempting to get to Iceland, but there is there are some reasons why you would want to launch from Iceland. But uh, at the same time, you'll you'll find that people are. Uh, I mean, everyone knows that no one likes working with the government, but at the same time, we um, we do need to rely on it and and. Yes, things can be a bit slow and a bit complicated, but generally in Iceland, the government is quite um, sort of resolution oriented. And that's how they did it. They just came here, they had the conversation, they showed patience, uh, they worked with uh, local partners, um, they were creative, or we were creative. But at the same time, we also had institutions that were kind of willing to, to help out. Now, thank you. I appreciate that. A couple of um, things that we've discussed earlier is Iceland's uh, very specific um, attitude in terms of environmental impact, um, you, not putting anything into the ocean. And of course, most rockets these days, you know, do have things go into the ocean. Skyrora needed to retrieve everything that they launched um, from the ocean, that sort of complication. So can you elaborate? Okay, maybe not talk about what was Skyrora's mo uh, motivations, but why would any agency want to launch? from here what geographically or what is it about Iceland that that might be advantageous I mean I think the main reason is um, polar orbit that it is a I mean it's somewhat of a fantastic location for that um, another reason is uh, that our airspace is quite large you can you can sort of you can easily launch here um, without encroaching on on other nations airspace um, which is a bit more of an issue in Europe, particularly. Um, um, we also happen to have quite a lot of uh, space uh, that is uh, has has high level of infrastructure, but actually isn't highly populated, which is quite rare. Uh, and that's been one of the attractions that um, the companies that contact us are looking into. You can. Uh, you can launch in the middle of nowhere and you can still have uh, 4G and fiber optic cable and, and, and um, transportation methods. Uh, but, and then you can't really deny that like one of the reasons is that there is just this race of being able to launch and uh, it's, 
it's a very complicated policy and a permit um, structure to set up and we've seen a lot of countries struggle with it so um, that's another that's also one of the reasons I mean people are just looking at uh, new opportunities because there is a race uh, going on in being able to launch and launch quite a lot yes so how do you, I mean, from your personal position or the position of your organization, I mean, how do you see Iceland developing in terms of these things? Let's say I'm Rocket Lab and I want to build a, an actual launch facility to take advantage of, you know, this spectacular polar orbit opportunity, because obviously they already do that in New Zealand. Um, but, you know, there might be something about Iceland that would be, you know, offer some advantages as well. Um, nothing goes into the ocean with them, at least soon, because they're and have parafoil recovery of their first stage. So, you know, it, if they wanted to build more of a permanent facility, um, you know, it, I mean, I'm not going to have you speculate how the government would react, um, but maybe, you know, more it's just how would you as an organization feel about it? Um, would that be too ambitious or, do, you know, are you looking for smaller scale stuff? <clears throat> well, as an organization, we've kind of learned that, you um, it's uh, that you can you can set small and reasonable goals, but it's been uh, in our short history we've um, we've always had to kind of overshoot that. We've we've grown and had our growing growing pains, and there's been more of a market need for the organization that we ever uh, anticipated. Um, I think the idea of a permanent launch facility is, is relatively relatively new and there are certain things that we have to look into uh, is there appetite among the public would be one uh, there is a, quite a lot of environmental questions that would be asked and I think it's fair that they are they are asked and then obviously we have uh, the big question is just does actually the government want it because I don't really feel like it's a decision that me or us at Space Iceland should be making it is right. sort of a national policy decision. But I think um, given that uh, we would see support from, uh, we would see uh, sort of a market interest, uh, relative interest from the public and the government, I think uh, it would we would not be in its way, but we would champion it. Um, and that's also sort of how we are set up uh, in Iceland. Iceland doesn't have a very clear policy of opportunities that it wanna wants to um, to try to uh, develop. Um, and launching was actually never part of like when we originally set up space. Island. It was not. It was intentionally not part of the strategic plan or the focus. But it is very. It became very clear very quickly that it is an opportunity, and we've kind of taken the approach that. Uh, while Iceland has not finalized uh, or kind of even on a government level uh, started a national space plan, we are obviously quite like we we are we do respond to market need. That is how we have been able to um, multiply the activity in the country. Um, so we would be we would be very um, positive towards it, but the precursion would be they would there would need to be sort of a, a market interest right. and then some sort of political indication that people would want it. Thank you. Um, another question that I think would a lot of my viewers would probably want me to ask is right now um, Elon Musk is, is struggling with the FAA. Local community in South Texas around the Boca Chica and South Padre Island area, that sort of thing, because Starship, you know, is being, of course, the most gigantic rocket ever created, has the potential of, you know, causing sonic boom damage, you know, shattered windows, possibly debris if it explodes on the pad, something like that, because it's so close to inhabited areas you know that sort of thing um you know but on the other hand it brings a tremendous amount of economy into that area they've employed tons of people and the the amount of money flowing into that region is is ginormous let's say for example um the uh let's say elon musk gets a, a wild hair one day and says you know what i'd like to launch starship it's a fully reusable vessel so nothing will ever go in the ocean off of it, it does have a lot of greenhouse gases it does have that associated with it but you know we can look what we could accomplish if we launched 
from here and it would be you know hundreds of kilometers away from any inhabited area so we don't have to worry about any civilians being in the way you know is something that ambitious do you do you think you know iceland would ever get there or do you think that that sounds just a little too frightening a little too ambitious um no i mean Iceland uh, has a tendency to be able to actually take leaps uh, when there is a, a need for it. Um, I mean, SpaceX is quite uh, invested in launching from the US, so uh, this is a theoretical question. Yeah. Um, I think um, SpaceX would run into other issues. Uh, it, it could be hard for him to find an area that, that uh, doesn't have uh, quite lively bird life. Or, um, or sort of fauna, which he, he would have to protect. Uh, but I don't see there being sort of automatic opposition because it's SpaceX or because it's it's Musk. Uh, but well, it would uh, it would be a challenge for him. But I don't. I do. I do believe that um, SpaceX, like like anyone else, could quite easily have a conversation here uh, right. with with the government and work with he would have the pro, he would probably easily have uh, the support sort of theoretical support of the sector here because it would be a, a massive infusion of capital um, and then it's just a question of um, finding an area that uh, you would be able to place it without disrupting um, protected nature bird life or any sort of animal life which right. uh, which thankfully is, I mean, it is quite stringent here, and and, I, and you would you will never really see Space Iceland lobby for less environmental protection. We might have discussions about the kind of the technicalities of how we can follow it, but you'll never see us say, well, the only thing that the sector needs is just less stringent environmental protection. Right. And, and I, I agree with that, by the way. I'm, I'm a big champion of environmental protection myself. Um, so let me switch gears a little bit. Um, let's get off the, the launching topic for a moment and instead talk a little bit about things that have had an extensive amount of activity. And that is the fact that, you know, Iceland uh, bears a great deal of geological resemblance to Mars, even more so than the moon with all the volcanism and the, uh, the impact of glaciation on said volcanism. A lot of similarities there. Can you tell us a little bit about what's been happening in that regard in preparations to go to Mars? I mean, I saw an astronaut uh, or a prospective astronaut ascending a glacier in one picture that I have here, that sort of thing. If you, Yeah, um, I mean, that's a very kind of usual activity in Iceland. I mean, I never, uh, I think it was three years ago that uh, we started this. I would never ex expected that astronaut training or analog astronaut training would become something I, I, would, I don't want to use the word mundane but it's become very common to be organizing those so that is a perfect example of sort of the participation that Iceland has and I mean the legacy behind that is obviously the Apollo astronauts uh, training in Iceland um, so it was a uh, it was a training in sampling for geology um, and um, they they came here twice i think it was 64 and 67 or 65 and 67 uh that is a bit embarrassing that i don't remember the years for uh something that i talk about almost i don't every either day. <laughs> but, um, and uh, i mean it's it, it might seem quite insignificant for space faring nation but it actually is quite huge for our legacy it, it means that we were able to contribute in some way uh, to the Apollo missions. It, it, it does mean that uh, a large portion of the men that went to the moon have personal connections in the, in the local community. And it inspired, it inspired the generation to, to, um, to seek this. Uh, and we, we do have a similar uh, example, which is uh, when CNES uh, launched four suborbital rockets in 64 and 65. Uh, which inspired obviously I mean it, so that's the effect it has but astronaut training is is relatively common I mean some of it is sort of more space enthusiasm mm. uh, or, or tourism some of it is more science oriented and then uh, you have uh, sort of 
something in between. You have the university graduates and so on that are kind of starting their career and can participate in this relatively inexpensive missions. Uh, we had one this summer where um, we had two groups of astronauts uh, sealed in a cave for a few days. Um, they um, uh, they have to they have a I think a, it was an eight hour window to set up communication devices and their habitat, and then communicate. Um, it was via text or via email in a in a way um, with with Earth for a few days and uh, and resolve some tasks. Uh, so yeah, that that's a very common activity. But I would also note that Earth observation is obviously, um, I mean, it's huge in this country. We, we do rely on it, um, but maybe not as picturesque as astronaut training or launching. So, uh, but in uh, but I would say often more exciting because it actually is where our growth is. Um, so this this is sort of the strength that where we started, uh, and this is our focus. These are sort of low hanging fruits to develop, but then launching came into existence, and and we link the sector quite a lot with traditional sectors. I mean, uh, uh, and you, I mean this is also very common in uh, in I would say Europe or sort of smaller states. Uh, there is there is a need and use for skill and tech transfer from space to agriculture, to fishery, right. um, to urban planning. Uh, and uh, we've, uh, just as an example of this, and I know I'm talking a little bit no, too long, right. but just as an example of this, uh, we did um, an event with the city of Reykjavik on AI in urban, uh, in urban environment. And I mean, you might, and a lot of people ask, like, why was Space Iceland involved or even so, um, aggressive in making sure that we would have this uh, event and then the cooperation afterwards with the city but like there, there is really not you don't really do much in space without AI and 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 vice versa so if you could hit two top quick topics for me in the time we have remaining then um, and you just mentioned both of them so this is a great segue first of all let's talk about the whole space observation thing because Russia just created a huge mess in low earth orbit um, and uh, and what makes Iceland an advantageous place to set up a tracking station uh, well I mean <clears throat> An advantageous place, um, or just something that you know. It's, why do a lot of people like doing it here, or why why do people set it up? Is there a governmental interest in it, or? Oh, all right. Um, I think, I mean, again, that has to do with location. Mm -hmm. It's a good location for one, but I I also think it has to do with again this. Uh, I mean, Iceland does have an incredibly good infrastructure for such a small country, so there's just an ease to it. It is relatively easy to um, to put them in place. And I know that doesn't sound like a very sexy answer, but I mean, no, I mean it's just very easy. I know well, like relative yeah. to the scale of the project, obviously. I mean, when I was, uh, sorry to interrupt you, um, when I was traveling myself in some very isolated rural areas of this country, and yet I still had Wi-Fi access and that sort of thing. So yeah, I, I see what you're talking about. You can set something up in the middle of nowhere here and still have access to high-speed internet and that sort of thing so your data can get out you know without having to put you don't have to build your own infrastructure really because yeah. it's already there um, so yeah that's that's pretty so let me let me transition to the AI thing because that is a thing you've mentioned a few times to me tell me a little bit about Iceland's involvement in in what Elon Musk calls the biggest existential threat <laughs> to the human race <laughs> what how do, how do how, how is Iceland involved in that? Um, well, AI, th there's a university here called the University of Reykjavik, and they are quite strong in AI, and then uh, I would say the same about uh, the University of Iceland, obviously. Um, well, I mean, when I say that we have uh, relatively good strength in AI, it does not necessarily mean that we are uh, uh, on, a, uh, on a military scale or, or, or kind of at that top. But, but, but if you look at... Um, if you look at uh, small states and uh, opportunities in AI, I mean, there's a reason why kind of smaller uh, markets are able to disproportionately utilize it. It's uh, it's expensive, yes, but that you can do a lot without. Uh, 
Uh, you can do a lot with the knowledge that we have for relatively little. You can kind of su su supersede, supersede your size. Um, it, it does, uh, with sort of relatively low hanging, um, uh, also low tech, which is weird to talk about when we talk about AI, but there, there, there are levels of uh, complexity when it comes to it. Uh, you can uh, develop quite uh, substantial um, job growth and and kind of and and participate in, in in larger more complicated projects. So, so I think that's one of the reasons why it's such an obvious strength that Iceland has. Uh, this is a country that is. Uh, uh, does have um, high uh, participation in the the, the work uh, market. Uh, it's it's relatively uh, well educated. Uh, I mean, I would say highly educated, and uh, does have this infrastructure that you need for uh, for let's just call it computer science in general. I mean, it doesn't yeah. seem like you would need much of an infrastructure because it's so common and and kind of mundane today, but. Uh, but these are not necessarily opportunities that you have everything. So it just kind of naturally becomes a very obvious, obvious need. And then we are linked with uh, Earth observation and utilization of, of space data, which is just highly important in this country. Uh, it's, a, it's a vast island with not too many people. Uh, it has a lot of volcanic activity. Uh, um, uh, nature i mean it is stunningly beautiful but one of the things that is very easy to forget if you're not from here that it might be pretty but it's also extremely dangerous yeah um uh so then you have then you also have this sort of natural need for data and earth observation which builds up a knowledge base and then ai just comes very naturally there um so that's why we mention it as a strength, because uh, one of the things that we can do with the incredible amount of observation data is that we are starting to see uh, implementations of it and end user implementations that we would never have dreamed of. Uh, and my science, uh, my, my background isn't really science. I come from politics. I mean, this is a political position, really. Um, so I've had to catch up a lot since uh, since I started this, uh, and I sit in on meetings uh, where we are discussing different new ways of how we can uh, manipulate Earth observation data, and and like it's just it's very clear that AI and this data it just goes hand in hand. But it's also I mean this might sound silly. There's also just another thing that people we know but tend to kind of forget. But like there is no Skype. Or uh, on Mars. Well, there is no Skype in the world anymore. Right. And we mostly use uh, Zoom, but um, but there is no Skype on Mars, and there there is no clear way of communicating dem uh, uh, demands directly. So, like, you, you just space has, is an area that is just almost it's unoperational without uh, AI. Right. So that's why we focused on it. But here in Iceland, particularly. We are implementing AI in the city a little bit more, and that's one of the things that you have to kind of uh, look into. Implementing AI on a on an urban scale, right. it's just on a massive scale, it can have consequences that we don't really know about. Or Give me a quick possibly. example. Sorry to interrupt you. Just a quick example of of uh, urban implementation of AI. I mean, uh, an obvious one is: uh, can we? Uh, uh, is there a way of uh, higher efficiency in the public transit system right. and, and that's a very obvious one uh, uh, and we've had examples in the US I can't remember which city it was that used AI to increase uh, efficiency of, uh, of school buses and actually it worked great like it was just uh, it worked better than anyone wanted but what what the AI never took into account is that some groups of some groups of parents have uh, have uh, significantly more political capita than others so the AI that just went into kind of looked into f efficiency didn't really wasn't really able to uh, understand that if you um, increase the quality on certain groups uh, or certain individuals but for efficiency reasons for the for the greater good of the system certain uh, people kind of get what they perceive as uh, as worse service 
the political backlash is so massive that this the project becomes a failure. So that's one example of of kind of you implement AI and it just has consequences that you never really yeah like you wouldn't even dream of this. Well, Thor, I wanted to thank you very much for the time you've spent. Um, it really sounds like I mean, there's so many things about this nation that I think a lot of people simply don't realize. It's ideal location for um, you know polar, polar orbital shots, for example, um, and then of course the astronaut training, its similarity to Mars, and you know our ambitions of going there, and also what you're talking about with AI, perhaps something that could you know help us track these thousands of pieces of space junk and determine how far away we are. Really Really, you know, in, in a real time basis, perhaps of some sort of catastrophe happening up there that endangers our low Earth orbit network. So, it, from everything you've told me, it sounds like that this this small country, uh, <laughs> the northern fringes of the world, really has a potential to make a big splash uh, in the space industry. So, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. It's a pleasure. And until the rest of the world recognizes what I've seen today, I urge all of you to stay angry about space.